<laughs> Very eventful. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Too bad about the Royals. They lost. I know. They were doing well. Way better than anyone thought. Okay. Well, welcome to our online folks. Let's go ahead and dig in this morning. Let's get it recording. Am I missing something? Okay. Oh, we're already recording. Last Share. There we go. Okay, so we made it through the end of chapter four during our last session. So we are going in to Genesis chapter five. And so we're going to get some genealogies. We're going to get a very strange passage before we get to the flood. So we'll just keep in mind we're going over this primeval history that's going to take us through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So we had at the end of the last chapter that Seth comes into the picture and almost in replacement for Abel. And it says that Seth and also Cain are living amongst many other peoples. And so clearly this is not intended to be just the genealogy of one family as if everyone comes from Adam and Eve when the text tells us that these first children of Adam and Eve are living amongst other peoples of the world. So it's more of the origin story of the Hebrew people. And so this genealogy will continue in chapter five. This is the list of the descendants of Adam. When God created humans, he made them in the likeness of God, male and female. He created them and he blessed them and called them humans when they were created. So we have a repetition of the words from Genesis 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness. So that's interesting that we have a little bit of a discrepancy from the verse before it. So they were created in the likeness of God. But when Seth comes into the picture, um, in part, he's the likeness of God, but also he's according to the image of Adam, suggesting that this transformation that took place at the fall is now perhaps impacting Seth as well. The days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. Seth lived after the birth of Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Canaan. Enosh lived after the birth of Canaan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. We're going to keep going, folks. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mehalel. Kenan lived after the birth of Mehalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. Mahalalel lived after the birth of Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalalel, that was a better way to pronounce it, were 895 years and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. Jared lived after the birth of Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. Okay, let's pause there for just a moment since we have a little bit of a change with the story of Enoch. So we're getting almost very similar timelines here when your main childbearing years come between 105 to 130 years. That's when you, you know, settle down, start your family at that ripe old age of 130. And then after that, they have these 
other 800 plus years so that they're living into the 900s. And so this is part of an ancient Near Eastern method of genealogy where the intention was to go over long periods of time in either 10 or 12 generations. So there's a lot happening here with ancient numerology. So these numbers were important to these ancient worshipers who are ascribing meaning. So there will be later Jewish movements that get even deeper into trying to extract meaning from numbers, this sort of numerology. Did these folks actually live 900 plus years? Extremely unlikely, given that what we know of ancient humans is that their life expectancy was even much less than ours. However, they're using these big numbers to make more of theological points. So when we get further into our genealogy, something's going to shift dramatically where God decides that humans should not be living these great periods of time because now they're becoming almost too much like God with these almost eternal or infinite numbers. And so God will limit their life expectancy. And so we'll get to that in just a moment. We have Enoch. Enoch is famous for being like Elijah as the only two people who supposedly did not experience death, but instead were taken up into the heavens. And so we get this phrase that Enoch walked with God. We don't know exactly what that means, but obviously it, it seems as if Enoch was particularly righteous or in tune with the ways of God in some special way. And so um, in recognition of Enoch's faithfulness, he's taken up into the heavens rather than experiencing death. He is no more because God takes him. Um, any questions or comments about these genealogies? Yeah, Chris. Well, I know it's a convention of the worldview at the time, but I just have to say it's very objectionable that these men could produce all these children completely on their own. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, <laughs> Someone emailed me uh, last week and was like, um, we didn't talk very much about the patriarchy in this text. And I was like, well, we did the week before. And every single week we could spend a lot of time talking about the inherent patriarchy in the text. Yeah. Where are these sons and daughters coming from? All we get are the males in the line and nothing else as if they're appearing out of thin air. Yep. Uh, yeah, Diane. When I read it last night, I didn't print it, but today uh, where it says and whoever, whichever male had other sons and daughters, it doesn't it doesn't say after the the name um, that they may have had children before. It's just this is the one who becomes sons and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great observation. So Diane said, you know, it doesn't say that they had sons and daughters after the name person. So perhaps some of these sons and daughters came before. That is very much possible. Um, another explanation for why one person's named is just in terms of um, inheritance rights, the patrilineal inheritance rights, which would go to the firstborn. And so that would be the firstborn male would be the only one really important enough to be named. Um, which is why it's very significant as we go through the Genesis story that the history of the Hebrews subverts that constantly in which it's the second born that often receives the inheritance from God or that is named as the special one. So we can maybe assume that these are firstborn, but the text is going to very intentionally subvert that. So that's a really good observation. Anything else? Yeah, can you hear me? All right. Picking up with Methuselah, has anyone heard that name and why that name is the oldest? Yeah, we're about to get the oldest living person in scripture, which is the grandfather of Noah. So when Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. Methuselah lived after the birth of Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. 
When Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son. He named him Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. Lamech lived after the birth of Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. Um, so we are about to be introduced to the most important character in this genealogy, because it's where the text will pick up with the flood story. And remember, I said that we've got numerology happening here for the ancient Israelites, where these long periods of years are meant to just signify that a significant amount of time has passed. And then we get this final number, you know, what you know out of basic Hebrew numerology, um, what's the significance of Lamech and his age? Seven. Yeah, that triple seven we all know about, sort of the sense of completeness. And so there's been this completeness to this long period of time, and now we get the next major figure. So this is just a way where they don't have full historical records of everyone who has lived, but they're going to paint these wide brush strokes to get us from Adam and Eve's progeny all the way to the story of Noah. After Noah was 500 years old, um, so he waited a little bit, established his career, got married, went on, traveled a little bit. Um, Noah became the father of Shem, Hem, and Jepheth. All right. Any questions on Genesis 5? Yeah, can you hear me? Pastor? The, the numbers and Pastor. The interpreters or the translators of Scripture. Yeah. You know, when we say, we say later in New Testament times that it was the number of days and it was the number of years, and we believe that to be days and years, why would the translators or those that, you know, the canonization process, why would they say here, here, and here, here, when they're obviously two different measures, like maybe this is months. Oh, good question. Um, so Brian says, you know, is this intended to be months rather than years? Um, that's a very good question. So the Hebrew word being used is years. So um, this is what they this is what they intended. Um, to, that's what they intended, but we've seen ancient diggings, and people are twenty-seven. And exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so it doesn't exist, but it just is. Absolutely. Uh, dissonance is not scary within religious texts at this time. So they're reading this. They know these people didn't live to 977, um, but yet it's the story they tell. Right. Yeah. All right. Master. Do we have an example of that? I mean, it would be like, um, you know, Rip Van Winkle or um, what other stories do we have of long living people? Just the, you know, the, the cherry tree, what Dracula, yeah. Um, Benjamin Button, oh, that's a fun one. Oh, we got a hand from Ben. Hey Ben, I know you, uh, you let me make sure your sound is on here so I know. Let's see. All right, go ahead, Ben. Oh, hey, good morning. Uh, we got you. I was just, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of chat going on in the chat. Ooh, I, thank you. Um, had asked about, I was asking about the book or the books of ah. Enoch. And um, just thinking about that, um, you know, tradition in esotericism about uh, you know, the apotheosis of Enoch and how it was um, preserved in the Ethiopic texts, uh, especially, I mean, here in New Orleans, and I went to an Afrocentric bookstore yesterday, and they had this whole, whole books about, you know, um, books of the Bible that were in the Ethiopic manuscripts and not in the, you know, the Western canon. Um, so, and just, uh, just uh, wondering, you know, what the connection is there to you know, this Enoch and this uh, idea of him uh, you know, not, not dying at 365 years of age. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. I was absolutely going to talk about that and forgot. So thank you for 
bringing that up. So um, this character, Enoch, is going to become um, very popular, especially within Jewish mysticism. And so there is going to be a lot of sacred text attributed to Enoch as Enoch having written them. And so we have several books that you can read if you would like that are named after Enoch. And these books will do a lot about explaining kind of concepts of angels, angelology, mysticism, etc. And so what Ben is saying is that some of these texts are incorporated into the canons of other churches. So we have the canon that we read as Protestants. And then if you were to go to a Catholic church in between the Old and the New Testament, you would get um, the, uh, not the Septuagint, the Apocrypha. Um, and so you would have several more biblical texts that are written in that intertestamental period. Um, and then even beyond that, when you compare the um, contents of the canon from different Orthodox communities. And so what Ben is referring to is the Ethiopic church. You're going to have other texts incorporated into it. And so we could spend multiple lectures. I did this kind of two series lecture on exactly this topic a couple of years ago, um, just kind of explaining why certain books made it into our Western canon, why some didn't, how, how people made these decisions, et cetera. Um, but the books of Enoch are very interesting. Anything else you want to say on that, Ben? Um, yeah, I just also thought it was interesting that um, when uh, John D was uh, trying to communicate with angels, like under Queen Elizabeth, uh, supposedly they did so in the Enochian language. Oh, fascinating. All right. John Lee, is that right, Ben? John D, Dr. John D. Oh, John D. Thank you. Thanks, Malachi. <laughs> uh, excellent. Anything else on Genesis 5? All right. Let's continue. Chapter 6. And I'll try to monitor the chat better. Jordan, I know that you study this stuff too. So if there's anything you want to add, please feel free to. Okay. Uh, when people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humans was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humans on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the humans I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. Okay, so um, we've used the phrase etiology before. A lot of these primeval texts are meant to try to explain the origins of something or the history of something or the cause of something. And so this ties into Brian's question. They know they're only living a certain number of years. And so they're trying to explain why that is. And so they're saying like, well, our ancestors, they would live for hundreds and hundreds of years. They would have all these children. This is how the earth was populated. But at a certain point, you know, they're gathered around the fire. They're telling you stories at a certain point. God said oh, that flesh should not live that long. And so our, our days are numbered to 120. Again, this number is picked out because it's a multiple of, of, um, of 12, 10 times 12. Um, however, they're not living to 120 years either. So they're saying like, this is the maximum number of years that we're able to live. Um, but that's not actually how long that they were living. Then we have the story of the Nephilim. Have you heard this term before? 
Yeah, this very strange passage from Genesis where we get the Nephilim. The Nephilim will be referred to later as this species of giants when they talk about giants in the ancient days. And so they are um, going into the daughters of human and bearing children of them. And these are the heroes of old, warriors of renown. What parallels are you hearing in that explanation? Greek mythology, Greek mythology absolutely, yeah. where you have these half divine, half human figures that become the heroes. And so this is very much a trope that's involved in mythology, even before Greek mythology, that there are certain humans, the heroes, the warriors, the soldiers, they get their strength because they are mixed with some sort of divine spirit. And so the Nephilim, these giants are perhaps part of um, the divine retinue. So we are witnessing live as these texts are being written, this progression from polytheistic to monotheistic faith. And so um, as these texts are being written down, they're being written down by worshipers of Yahweh, but these early stories are being influenced by polytheistic, syncretistic worshiping communities. And so the Nephilim would have been divine beings that were part of this heavenly retinue where God has a whole host of other divine beings walking around with God. The sons of God are the Nephilim. In verse two. In verse two. Um, we're born to them. Um, oh, so the Nephilim are a race of giants and then that are also divine. And then the, the sons of God. Yeah, would be a reference to just divine beings, part of the heavenly retinue. Like angels? Um, not necessarily angels, just other gods, like kind of like Hercules. Not like Jesus. There's no concept of Jesus quite yet. Um, so this, yeah, so this is not, this is not Jewish or Christian faith as we know it. Oh. So this is being influenced by a polytheistic community who thought that there were many gods in the heavens. And that these gods had children themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Donna says her translation regarding the Nephilim says fallen ones. Um, and so there's going to be later this whole. I mean, people are reading these texts and trying to understand what they mean um, later as well within the Jewish communities. And so there's going to be a tradition of fallen divine beings. And so that will be picked up later when we get concepts of Lucifer or Satan, that Satan is a fallen angel. We don't get that in the actual biblical text. Um, Satan's never referred to as an angel. Um, but yeah, this concept of something being fallen or fallen to the earth and then roaming the earth. Yeah, it's just part of this, this mythology. All right, any comments from our online folks? Any other comments about this? Does that make sense? We can't understand this passage of the Nephilim with our logical minds. We're not trying to understand this historically. We're not trying to understand this logically. We're not trying to understand this monotheistically. This is this, this is a people group who are not yet worshipers of Yahweh, who are thinking of gods as having children. Okay, all right. So uh, a couple months ago, I did a sermon on the flood. Um, if, if any of you were here for that, um, I think it provided a lot of helpful context for the story and what exactly is going on um, and what theologically is trying to be said through the Hebrew flood story, but we have dozens of different cultural groups who have flood stories that mirror the story of Noah in so many clear parallels. And this story is not the first one on the scene. And so different communities are drawing from each other's flood stories using a lot of the same parallels. Um, was there an actual historical flood event? Uh, probably locally. 
Um, and that's all people know when people are in the ancient Near East writing about a flood. Well, when the Nile goes over its banks um, or you've got various, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and you hear about those flooding, uh, you're going to write about that and think of it as a major flood event. Doesn't mean a flood's happening in Americas. Doesn't mean a flood's happening over in China um, because they don't have a global sense yet. They only understand what's happening locally. So perhaps there are local flood events, um, but it's interesting that this story will proliferate um, to other communities across the world. As I mentioned, um, there are native indigenous people um, in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands who have um, very, very similar flood stories. Um, but what's uh, unique about the Hebrew story is that they're incorporating the flood myth into the concept of covenant. So what sort of covenant is going to be made with Noah through this story? And that's going to be the thrust of the story of Noah. So these are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Hem, and Jepheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. Um, so I mentioned that we're going to the focus on the covenant that's made with Noah. But in terms of having explanatory value, these people are trying to think to themselves, okay, if bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. And scripture is going to refute that, but they're trying, this is one of the major theological questions they're asking. They're trying to wrestle with. Then, you know, we kind of see a lot of corruption around us. We see a lot of sin around us. Why doesn't God wipe out all of humanity and start over? Is that possible? Are we under the threat of being completely destroyed by the gods? When we experience famine, when we experience flood, could it be because God's going to kill all of us because God's upset? And so they're going to write a story like this where they say, well, there was a time when God really was upset and was going to wipe out the earth. But at the end of it, these promises were made. And so they're going to hold on to these promises of Noah that no matter how bad things get, that God isn't going to wipe out humanity entirely. So they're asking these questions. Uh, is it possible that God could just destroy all the earth? Isn't it possible that God is inherently evil and that he is created because creation reflects him oh interesting so could god be inherently evil because creation reflects god yeah it's an interesting question and what we're doing through this text is trying to differentiate between um yeah yeah trying to differentiate between god as god exists and god as god is written about so what are the ways in which people groups write about god in their own image um and that's happening here, very much so. Uh, now the earth was corrupt. God saw that the earth was corrupt. But all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. Oh, we got something in the chat here. Doesn't Shem just mean name? Yes. Um. And we've got Jordan saying followers of Gnosticism would basically say that God creation is evil. Absolutely. Um, so, Toby, just to um, add on to what you're saying is there are going to be theological trains of thought. What's Jordan's referring to where the material world is corrupt. Um, and this ties... Basically based on Gnosticism is based on the idea that you have to escape the corrupt material world. Um, and this is going to tie back into Enoch, actually, because Enoch is going to be an important figure in Gnosticism with this idea that Enoch must have discovered some sort of secret knowledge when Enoch was walking with God that allowed him to be taken up rather than to die. And so Enoch was able to escape from the material world because of whatever secret knowledge he acquired. And so Enoch will become a figure within Gnosticism. Anything else there, Jordan? Yeah, let me, uh, Hello. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Uh, I just <clears throat> noticed really for the first time that it also says Noah walked with God. 
And that's just an interesting parallel that I've never really thought about or seeing talked about elsewhere. Yeah. Um, that's just something I noticed. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And I'm going to go back. So we got Enoch walked with God. Um, and then Noah walked with God. Jacob, wouldn't, wouldn't the other major thing besides covenant be that, but for some good people who walk with God, who covenant, who, who connect with God and speak on behalf of God, humanity kind of is doomed, that, that it has been the salvation and it's all the way to the point of Jesus, but um, that, we, that we rely on it. Yeah, um, great question. So Shirley says, could another theme besides the covenant be that there have always been people who walked with God and without them, then things would be doomed? Um, very good question. What we're going to see is that even these people who walk with God are also flawed and they're going to make mistakes. They're going to break the covenant themselves. And yet the covenant will still be upheld on God's end even when it's broken on humanity's end. Yeah, yeah, great observation. Okay, so God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood or gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its width, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. And take with you every kind of food that is eaten and store it up and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. All right. So we have explicit instructions on how the ark is to be created. Now, our um, fundamentalist friends in where is this museum at? I think it's in Arkansas, Tennessee. Kentucky, Kentucky, yeah, have built a life-size ark um, that you can go. They have built it according to these dimensions, and so you can check it out, walk through it. Um, it's not big enough, of course, to hold every species of animal known to exist, um, but it is a really cool thing to see <laughs> that they have spent their money on. Um what do you say? There might be, yeah. But we have an ark. Um, and so we are bringing in at this point two of every kind of creature. Any questions on this part? Genesis 6? Yeah, very interesting. Um, so Chris says, um, every creeping thing of the ground, does it invoke the serpent? I would think absolutely, because we are told that the curse is that he, the serpent is to creep along the ground. So this, this new snake gets on board the ark, saved from the flood. All right, let's read a little bit of Genesis 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate. Um, so I referenced this in that sermon. Um, do folks remember why we get this change of numbers between Genesis 6 and Genesis 7? For sacrificial purposes, yeah. 
Um, so remember that one of the authors of the Genesis text, again, this is all hypotheses, these different um, authors of Genesis, but the assumption is that one of these authors is particularly concerned with priestly needs. And so if you only brought two of every animal, a male and a female, and then you get off the ark, and it says right away when we get to the end of the story that Noah offered sacrifices, that would prevent that species from being able to proliferate. And so you need seven of those animals. And so that's why it's seven of every clean animal, because it was the clean animals that were um, sacrificed. And so there are stipulations for what makes a clean animal based on its hooves, based on what it eats. Um, and then you can just take a pair of the unclean animals because they're not going to be sacrificed. Seven pairs of the birds of the air. Yeah, Toby. Where does the concept, where do scholars think the concept of a sacrifice comes from? Because it, 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 it's like an accomplished fact in the Bible. There's no for why you do it. It can enable author offerings, which I guess are sacrifice, at least enable kids, yeah. right? Because he kills, slaughters, whatever he raised. Yeah. Um, so Toby's question is, where do we get the entire premise of sacrifice at all? And that's a very good question. It's something that someone noted um, a, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Cain and Abel is that we had the presentation of sacrifice, even before we have the stipulation under Hebrew laws of what the sacrifices were meant to be for um, and that they were required. So the, again, this is not only the Hebrew people who are part of offering sacrifices. And we have sacrifices being part of ancient rituals across the globe. And so we're going to see the same thing in different people groups that never meet. So we're going to get this in the Americas as much as we get this um, within the ancient Near East. There's going to be several different reasons. One, the idea that you offer sacrifice to the gods to appease them in some way or to make them happy so they give you blessings. Um, the sacrifices within the Hebrew community are going to shift and morph into the concept of kind of sin or forgiveness that um, when you get the stipulation of an eye for an eye, well, what do you do um, instead of taking your own eye or taking your own life? Well, then you offer up the blood of an animal in your place. Um, and so that blood will, um, you know, be what the gods need or God needs uh, in order to forgive the sin that's been committed. So um, it's just human ritual as it develops. Say that again. Archety archetypal behavior, um, and it's just kind of the homo sapiens uh, are, are going to develop this. They're going to develop rituals. We've got religious practice from the very beginning of human existence where we're going to see, you know, people being buried with items in the ground very early in human history, um, believing that those items perhaps continue with them. Um, all right. Okay, so we got seven. Let's just read a little bit more. Seven birds of the air, male and female, to keep their kind alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will reign on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came on the earth. And Noah with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came on the earth. All right, we're going to stop there. We'll pick up the rest of the flood story. Any last questions or comments or observations? Yeah, Bob. Real quick. Um... This comes up a lot in religious trauma because a lot of kids grow up with the idea. I know mm. it's cartoonized quite a bit. Uh, it was hard, but they look like kids grow up with the idea that this could happen. And the flood, you know, anytime we don't have to worry about as much here, but when floods come and hurricanes and things like that, and that's tied into God's wrath. Mm -hmm. that yeah. It, that plays out. Yeah, yeah. Two great observations here. So Bob was saying, you know, seeing this theme a lot within religious trauma, um, first, the idea of God's wrath generally of wiping out humanity. Um, and so we'll have to deal with that next week.
Um, but then second, this ascribing to natural disasters, the wrath of God, even today, you know, these hurricanes in Florida, what's the cause of them? Um, is it punishment for something? Yeah. Um, we saw that with Katrina, for sure. Yeah. yeah. In my in Florida, he says a lot of people are preparing for the end of time. Hmm. Like that wow. Bob says a friend in Florida um, says people there are preparing for the end of times, experiencing these natural disasters. Um, ben, I like this comment. Another element of sacrifice that is observable and enforceable and easy for a priesthood to control. Yeah, absolutely. That's Brian? Interesting. Oh, go. That, well, it's interesting that you would have a priestly uh, people uh, protecting or uh, making uh, room for their activities. Yes, by, yes, yes. So they're, I like the idea yeah. of control. Yeah. Um, Toby's tying your comment in, Ben, to what we were saying about different authorship, that here we have the priestly author really concerned about making sure sacrifices are capable um, as a means of control and enforcement. Yeah, Brian? I'm looking at verse 10, and I don't think I've ever noticed this before. Did, did Noah build the ark in seven days? Uh, did you, did you, no, what the sons of sons of I think that's exactly what they got on the boat after they got on the boat. Yes, yes, they sat on the boat for seven days. Okay. Yeah. So there was enough elapsed time to build the ark. Supposedly, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I like that. All right. Let me uh, close this with a word of prayer. Um, God, as we as we um, come into these stories um, and try to take out meaning and purpose, uh, we just ask for your guidance for us to be able to take these ancient mythologies, to put them into their context, and also to be able to speak to people who are looking to you and yet seeing these texts sources of destruction or wrath. Um, may we be able to speak and breathe life into these texts um, that speaks of grace, that speaks of human connection, that speaks of your presence in the midst of something like a natural disaster. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Good to be with you online. See folks in the room in the sanctuary. Okay. Let's do this. You sure. <laughs>